Okay, today we're going to be talking about behavioral change. Um, one of the big things about this is, and it's probably the foundation of public health and really understanding how to support a community to change a habit or behavior, um, or to help an individual take a look at how they can change. But we know that just telling somebody to change a behavior or to stop doing something, or you yourself, you might have tried to change a behavior, it's not always that easy. So one of the things we're gonna have you do this week is look at a discussion post where you're gonna be watching a video and talking about what rewards you think would help change your behavior. And in this PowerPoint slide, um, I'm gonna talk ab about the different theories and then provide examples. So first things first, we know that behavior change has influencers. You need to know about why you need to change a behavior. You need to understand it. You need to have attitudes that you think something is good or bad. So for example, smoking is um, not good. It's, it smells or you don't like it. Um, you need to have the skills to actually stop a behavior or support a healthy behavior. You need to know how to do certain things to be successful. Um, you can see that beliefs are important. Whether you um, have a perception that it's going to impact you. The values, the religion can, a religion can support a behavior. Um, your access to services, um, and even your gender, what the influences around your gender, whether you think um, males, females can be influenced um, in behavior change. So here, here's why, um, it's important. You can increase someone's knowledge about a topic, but they say it's not feasible to do, so they don't do it. You could tell a community over and over again that you need to do certain things, but they don't have access to health care and they can't get into it. Or you could sit there and say, hey, you know, for example, they did um, uh, research on a, a group of um, people who showed criminogenic and antisocial behaviors, and you could tell them, you can increase your self-confidence, but people can have this tendency to be aggressive and you keep on pushing one thing, but it really shows that it does not change a behavior. So you really need to kind of look at each um, behavior and really understand what will really make a difference. Um, I put this website on here, Meth Change, the way I look at it. And if you go to methproject.org, you will see some really intense public service announcements. And what they found was is that this shocking, these shocking, intense meth change PSAs changed be people's behavior. But then after a while they saw it just increase again and, and go up or just start to go back where it was. Why is it? And what they found was is that people got used to the shock of it, but then they did they got kind of immune to it and they and they didn't it just kind of they got used to seeing the public service announcements and the shock value didn't have a long-term impact so go out to this methproject.org and take a look at some of those videos and think why is it that these videos started to lose their impact um so you need to think that behavior change can come within or it can be influenced by what people think on the outside. Um, there are basically, um, in your book, there are three um, behavior models that are in there. And I'm gonna cover each one of these behavior models in this PowerPoint, and then I'm gonna give you an example. So when in your assignment, I'm gonna ask you to choose one of these um, behavior models, so take a, Take a listen to this, you know, listen closely and see which model you want to have um, at, that you want to explore and that you want to uh, focus in on your assignment. So the health belief model is really famous. It's like the one that people in public health and health education talk about the most. And it's the idea that personal beliefs influence behavior. What you think influences your behavior. So influence your behavior. So what happened was back in 1966, the health belief model was developed by a psychologist. 
And what the, what the story goes is that 19 people in 1950s, people were not getting screenings for TB. And the United States Public Health Department at Health Services was just completely perplexed. Here's what they were doing. Take a look at this. This is the public awareness model that they were putting out there. They were putting out all these posters. Tuberculosis undiscovered endangers you. So looking at this, does this look like people need to be worried about tuberculosis? Families happily reading a newspaper? Hmm. So the idea was is that the model that came up was that people need to perceive the health belief model has these different components. People need to perceive that something's going to happen to them, like they're susceptible. They need to be, they need to be thinking, what's the benefit? I need to, if I go in for this TB testing, will it directly benefit me? They need to feel like they can actually get there. So if there are barriers to, for them to get the TB testing, then <clears throat> they're not going to go. And then finally, they need to think that, that getting TB, it could possibly be fatal. Or it could be serious. So they started to rechange, take a look at this model, and they they changed their their um, their awareness and their um, campaign based on these these different areas. So you also need to have a cue to action, like you need to have something to cue you, like um, you need to go get this this test right now. And then people need to feel like they could actually do something about like they personally they have the ability to do something self-efficacy this belief where you can make a difference you can change something so look at this perceived susceptibility this is what as a father sees throwing a child this is how the child sees it and this is how the mother sees it so it's this idea that you know doing something you can actually get uh, a disease let's see here um, here's another comic here, perceived susceptibility. You have a one chance, die, uh, chance of dying from a smoking related disease. Here's this person smoking. Never is going to happen to me. The odds of winning the Powerball are lottery are 8 million. This could be my lucky day. So, you know, it's the idea that something could really happen to you. Um, you know, for example, think about it with Ebola. Do you think you're going to get Ebola here? Perceived susceptibility? Probably not. It's a pretty serious disease, and we're going to be talking about that. But how? What's your really your chance of getting a disease? If you really think you're going to get something, you're going to be more prone to action. Perceived seriousness. Now, this is I alluded to this with the Ebola example. Do you think that? Okay, you might not think you're going to get. Ebola perceives uh, such susceptibility, but perceives seriousness. If you if you think Ebola is around and you're gonna obviously you're gonna you think you can get it, do you think that's really serious? And you're gonna say yes, it's really serious. Do you think the flu is really serious? Ah, uh, catch the flu. Yeah, you can catch the flu. Could you die from the flu? Yes, you could die from the flu. But maybe people have a look, they might not perceive it as being as serious as the Ebola. So that's really important. People need to think that the disease is really serious. So you could take a look at these meth projects. This really focused in on perceived seriousness. They drove in that meth addiction was intense and you can die. But after a while, people started to think, eh, and they stopped thinking it was perceived seriousness so people can really change their belief system on how serious they think a disease is so the other one is that you need to feel like you can actually do something what are the benefits of doing a behavior compared to the barriers so if you feel like something will really benefit you then you will push through all the barriers of getting through something like if it's hard to get access you're going to push through it if it's a high cost you will throw down money to get that vaccine. If it's gonna make you feel worse or better, that's important. So if it's, there's a barrier where it's gonna make you feel worse, but you know that the benefits of getting something done is really important, you'll get it done. So here's an example. A lot of parents supporting teens getting HPV shots. Some people will say, 
um, <clears throat> that it will directly benefit their child for a long time. I mean, it will prevent cervical cancer. It's directly tied to cancer um, rates being dropped. I mean, HPV is really, human papilloma virus is something that can be prevented. Um, here's another one. Colon screening is a good example of secondary prevention. Biopsies are used to move precancerous scales. And there's a 90% cure rate, right? So the benefits of getting um, colon screenings are huge, but the barriers might be that eh, people don't really want to do it. It might cost too much. They might be thinking, ah, I don't, ah, I don't want to get that screening done. So people need to feel like they can get past the barriers. So the other thing is, is that, you know, people need to feel like, you can change things. There, these are variables that can change. You can, you can make it culturally acceptable to go get a colon screening. You could increase education levels so people feel like, hey, you know, it's it's a perceived benefit. They, past experiences really can make someone feel like they can do something or not. The skill, and then of course motivation. So people need to have cues to action. This is a big thing with health belief. Points. Do you need to have like a cue? Did you wash your hands? There's a sobriety checkpoint ahead. There's no smoking in this area. The speed limit's 55. So this is a cue to action that someone did in another country. So, you know, obviously 999 is not our country. But your chest is tight. That's a cue to action. You can't breathe. You need to call emergency. You're getting pain. You need to do something. That's a cue to action. So do you believe you can actually do this? Right? Can you call 911? Can you make something happen? Okay. So with the health belief model, you need to perceive that something is susceptible, that you will actually get a disease, that it's, you can do it. You need to have a perceived seriousness that if you get this disease, you will die. <laughs> um, you, modifying factors. There are things that can support you um, in believing that something is serious. Cues to actions, there are things around the community saying, go get tested. People are telling you you need to do something. You see a family member get sick and you think, I need to do it. Or your doctor says, hey, let's get you screened. So all these things will influence you actually taking, making a difference and doing a behavior. So perceived susceptibility, perceived seriousness, both of these things, what people are saying you in, in, saying to you in a community, all these things can say, yes, you need to do this change. It will influence how you think. That's the health belief model. Okay, so example with the health belief model is that um, if you decide to do this one, you say, um, let's take smoking, for example. You feel like you're susceptible of actually getting lung cancer by smoking, you think lung cancer is extremely serious and you could die from it. You have everyone in your, in your cue to action, everyone in your, um, you know, got public service announcements telling you to quit. People are telling you to quit. You saw one of your family members get sick and, and, and it was awful with, to see them go through lung cancer, and your physicians told you that you need to quit, okay? You now have in your community all these cues telling you to, you need to change, and you think it's important to take this change. You go in, you go cue to action, you actually now have decided to do the sensation classes, and you are now on the nicotine patch. All those things support your change. That's a good example right there. Next is the social cognitive model. And this is quite simply that, you know, your environment and how you think influence your behavior. So let's say, now let's take the same smoking example. Everyone in your, in your social environment does not smoke now. Everywhere, you go to campus now, you can't smoke. It's against the law. Your inner feelings about whether you believe you can change this um, habit, but you've decided now, I can quit smoking. So now it influences your behavior. Those two things directly influence the behavior. So here's a perfect example. I, I brought you through it with smoking. Same thing can be said with physical exercise. 
your whole social environment, everyone's walking and jogging around you. Everything is influenced by that. And then your personal behavior says, hey, you know, jogging, um, biking, hiking makes me feel good. And then you have places where you can actually go biking and hiking. Okay. So that's how that works. The next one is um, the transtheoretical model. And this is the idea that people go through stages of change. And you can actually think about this with the behavior that you have. You have something called pre-contemplation where you think about it, but you don't do anything. And you think about it for a long, long time. And you might say, hey, I need to join a gym. But then you never really do anything about it. Then you really start to contemplate it. And you actually start to research gyms around you. But mm, you haven't done this thing where you actually signed up for a gym. But, you know, you've started researching it. Preparation stage, you actually start to get your gym back together. You uh, go in and you check around and you take a, a tour of the gym. Boom, action stage. You actually sign up for the gym and you go to two classes. You are moving into action stage and you're there. It's a great place to be. Maintenance stage means that you just don't go one week. You now make this a habit. And every week you go to the gym and you have habits. You have your backpack and, and you have your shoes in the car and you maintain it. And then term, termination stage is at the very end where you, you've done the behavior and, you're, you've, and it, the changes happen. But the reality is I'm going to tell you that you always need to be in maintenance stage. To, to really support a habit, to have it continually go on and on. And, and, and this is something that is in, you'll see in addiction models where they'll say it's important to stay in maintenance stage always. You always need to stay in main, maintenance stage. So here are the steps. Pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, maintenance, termination. So I have a video that um, has behavior change in there, and I'd like for you to take a look at that. And then one of the key big things in this model is really rewarding your action. You always need to have a reward or something that kind of supports that behavior change so that you stay in maintenance. So I know that um, one of the big things in um, and supporting a behavior of, of, of saying like sober and and free of a habit, um, like stopping drinking. Every year there is a birthday where people celebrate this uh, one year of sobriety. That's staying, that's a reward for staying in there. Um, maintenance will also would be a reward is going to weekly meetings and um, you know meeting with people and supporting that behavior. And, and on a personal level, doing something to reward that behavior that feels good. So it's important that it, that is really important, staying in that. So there are steps in changing this behavior. And that is the end of my slide show. So what I want you to do right now is I want you to go back out and choose one of the behaviors um, that I um, talked about and actually talk about how you'd go through that behavior change and then, um, and then talk about a reward to support that behavior. If you have any questions, please uh, post them in FAQs and um, feel free to, to ask them. The more questions, the better. Thank you and have a great week.